everybody. Um, so the homework from last time is up here at the front, so please pick yours up. Um, as far as how the class did in general in the homework, oh, this is probably one of the shortest and pretty most straightforward, uh, or yeah, most straightforward uh, one that you'll see. Um, everybody did fine, although several students didn't read the assignment very carefully, and you were supposed to have done 11.13 as described in the book, but then do it a second time as a non-ideal cycle, and some of you just didn't do that. So there were really only three worked out problems, so if you didn't do one of the three, then I just gave you a check, a check instead of a plus. Um, but nonetheless, the methods generally were fine. I think the, the biggest problem some students had was that there was the one problem, it was a 42, that had a refrigeration cycle, but it was talking about the heat exchange from that refrigeration cycle into a stream of water, and some students just didn't even recognize that the flow rate given was not the flow rate that you were asked to solve for. It was the flow rate of the water stream, not the flow rate of the refrigerant. So some students pretty much missed that whole problem just by not reading it carefully enough. Um, but nonetheless, um, also in that instance, when I find a heat transfer rate, I would prefer to use the mass flow rate and multiply it by the enthalpy change. Um, granted, water is a liquid, and many of you use CP times the temperature change, but still, it would be better just to use the data for saturated liquid water at the given temperatures rather than to use the specific heat as if it were an ideal process. Um, but nonetheless, most of you did just fine. So let's just get back to where we were last time. So this is going to be our last discussion of thermodynamic property relations. Um, you might recall from last time that um, I generated an equation based on what I called equation 8. Um, and again, I'm just going to keep using the same notation, that is the same numbering scheme. Um, we'll just continue numbering, but nonetheless, Uh, this equation was equation 8, and basically what we saw, or what we hopefully recognized, was that this particular equation is in the form of equation A. You know, dz equals m dx plus n dy. So since this is in the form of equation A, um, I can apply equation C to it. In other words, I can simply equate the partial derivatives of the two coefficients. Okay, so this is in the form of A, we use equation C, therefore, um, and what we found, um, and I'm not going through all the steps here, this is just a summary so we know where we left off last time. Uh, we ended up with this particular equation that I believe I called equation 13, and this is where we should have left it last time. Um, one of the reasons I'm doing this is because as I was looking at my notes and thinking about what we talked about on Wednesday, um, I wasn't sure I explained it exactly right, but now it should be a little more obvious. This is the correct explanation. Um, it's in the form of A, so we can use those other equations like B and C and D to manipulate, and that's exactly what we've done here. So we've simply used C, and we ended up with this equation. Now, similarly, Um, we can start with one of the other equations. Um, we'll start with equation 11. Um, and equation 11 is this one. Okay. Now you can see that this too is in the form of equation A, right? dz equals m dx plus n dy. So again, we can equate the partial derivatives of the two coefficients using C. So again, this is in the form of equation A. And we can simply use equation C. And what we would find is the following. So del CV, del VT is going to equal the temperature and then times the second partial of P with respect to T 
holding v constant. Okay. And this equation is going to be equation 14. Now, I did skip one step in here. Um, you would have to go back into your derivation of equation 13 from last time. And, you know, I used equation C, but then I actually have one other step that got from equation C to this equation. And I've done the same thing here. But nonetheless, these two equations are important to us. Um, once again, considering that we're trying to find relationships between the data that we can measure in a lab and the data that we're trying to pre present into our property tables, uh, this is exactly that, right? We have two equations now in terms of the specific heats, right? Specific heat to constant pressure, specific heat to constant volume. And they're in terms of what we can measure, temperature, pressure, and specific volume. So this is important to us. Now the next thing that I would like to do is equate these two equations. Um, that is equate equations, I'm sorry, I should have said equate these two equations. I would like to equate equations 8 and 11. So these two equations are the ones I can equate. And, and I'm, why can't I equate them? They're both equal to the change in entropy. So I'm just expressing the change in entropy two different ways. So our next step then is to equate 8 and 11. So I'm just simply going to write down these two equations. So we get Cp over T dt minus del V, del T P dp. And this equals then Cv over T dt, then plus del P del T V dv. Okay, um, so we can equate these because they're, this, they're both entropy. Um, now let's just rearrange a little bit. And in doing so, I'm going to collect the CP and CV terms together on the left-hand side of the equation. So they both have a dt over t attached to them. So let me just write it this way. Um, and then this is going to equal what's on the right-hand side of the equation. So here I'm just going to put the two partial terms. So del P, del T V, dV. And then that comes to the right-hand side as a positive, so plus del V, del T, P, D, P. OK. And then what I'd like to do is rearrange one more time. And this time I'm just going to put everything in terms of dt. So I'm only going to leave the dt by itself on the left-hand side of the equation. Now we get this. So we get t and then over Cp minus Cv. Um, Cp minus Cv. I think this is right as it is. It's a minus in there. So dt is equal to t over Cp over Cv and then del P del t v dv. Um, and then we just add to it the next term. So we would have the other partial derivative term. We still have a t over Cp minus Cv that we're bringing in from the left-hand side of the equation. And then the other partials, so del V, del T, P, D, P. Okay. And now I think what we need to recognize is that this is in a form that's familiar to us. Okay. Let's do this. Let's write the total differential. And we're going to do this um, specifically for T as a function of specific volume and pressure. So basically, that just gives me that dT is equal to, um, and you know, this is a total differential. So you're going all the way back to the earliest derivations, you know, and when we were looking at the Maxwell relations. So we know that the total differential can just be written as the sum of two of the partials. So this would be del T, del V, P, D, V, and plus del T, del P, V, D, P. Okay. So that's why I said that this equation that I just derived is in a form that should look familiar to us. They're the same equation, right? DT is equal to some coefficient dV plus some other coefficient dP. So basically, we could simply recognize that these are the same equation 
And now let's just equate one of these coefficients within each equation. In fact, I want to equate the first coefficient. So let's just equate this and this. So let's equate the coefficients of dv. Um, again, it's the same equation, so we can simply do that. So we now get the following. So we get t over cp minus cv. And then we have del p del t v. And then this is going to have to equal del t del v p dv. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. The dv is not there. I'm just equating the coefficients. All right, so we have this particular equation. Now, the next thing that we need to do is go back again to one of our early equations. And this equation is what I call D, which is called the cyclic relation. Okay. So I can write this in terms of any variables I want. I'm going to write it in terms of the variables that are within the partial derivatives above. So we would note that the partial of p with respect to t holding v constant times the partial of t with respect to v holding p constant times the partial of v with respect to p holding t constant has to equal minus 1. Okay. And then I'm just going to simply rewrite this. And I'm going to leave the del p del t v term by itself on the left-hand side of the equation. Um, and by the way, the reason I'm doing that is because eventually I'm going to plug it in to the equation above, right? There's a del p del t v term, and then ultimately simplify the equation. So we're going to write the equation above. So this is then equal to minus. And then we have a del v del t p. And a del p del v t. Now, if you look at this, you might say, well, wait a minute. That's not exactly the same thing. Uh, but it really is the same thing, right? I mean, I'm moving the del t del v p over to the denominator of the right-hand side of the equation. But then I'm just reversing the order, you know, inverting the term, and therefore moving it up to the numerator. So mathematically, del t del v p is the same as 1 over del v del t p. All right, so that's all I've done here. By moving it to the right-hand side, I've just rearranged the terms in the partial derivative. And mathematically, this is accurate. And then what I'd like to do is finally plug this in above. OK, so we're going to plug it right into there. All right, so now we have t over cp minus cv. And then we have this big term, so minus del v del t p and del p del v t. So there's the left-hand side of the equation. And the right-hand side of the equation is del t del v p. Um, but I'm going to do the same thing to this term that I just did to these terms over here. I'm just going to move it into the denominator, but then I'm going to reverse the order, which moves it back into the numerator. And basically, this just becomes 1 over del v del t p. Okay. So again, I've done the same thing that I did before. And now, let's rearrange. Uh, by the way, the reason I wanted to move this into this form it's because I've got the same term over here on the left-hand side of the equation. I'm just going to combine them in this next step. So let's rearrange and solve for the difference between cp and cv. So we have cp minus cv. Um, there's a minus sign, so we'll bring that over to the right-hand side along with the temperature. So, and then, of course, the whole thing is being inverted. So. You know, you'll have to follow this pretty carefully. But nonetheless, cp minus cv equals a minus t. And then I would have the del v del t p term and the second del v del t p term, which is going to come over. So that would be del v del t p squared. This is not the second derivative. This is the square of the first partial derivative. OK. 
okay? And then multiplied by del p del v t. And this is equation 15. Okay. So this is another one of those equations that's actually <laughs> going to be pretty important to us. Now, you know, again, I've gone through a pretty complete derivation here. Before I move on, I do want to mention one thing that um, you do have a homework problem, number 12-43. And I will note just a little bit of a hint on this problem. Um, it's very similar to this that I just finished here. Okay. In fact, when you do 1243, you're going to start exactly the same way as I started. I'm just going to equate equations 8 and 11. So if you want to give yourself a hint, you know, write this down, that on 12-43, it's very similar to this derivation of equation 15. You're going to start by equating equations 8 and 11. Um, and in the same way that we wrote the total differential for t as a function of v and p, um, you're going to do that again. And the only thing that's really different is that the manipulation of the equation up until the end of that problem is just a little bit different than it is from here on in. Okay? In fact, you're not even going to use the cyclic relation. Uh, but nonetheless, I just wanted to give you that hint that the problem that I assigned is pretty much the same up until this point, And then you have to think about how to complete it. So I just wanted to give you that little hint. Okay. However, the hint on the homework problem aside, why is this an important equation? One thing that you might remember is that we use specific heats a lot when we're dealing with ideal gases, right? And what we've already seen, and this was just presented to you way back in your first thermal course, is that the difference between Cp and Cv turns out to be R, the gas constant. Okay? Now, in ME301, that was simply just told to you. Okay? And at least in my class, I said, we can't really derive the existence of this yet, but we need to use it now as we're studying ideal gases with constant specific heats and all that. So, so we just had to use it. It was just given to you. It comes from this equation. In fact, what I'd like to do next is derive various ideal gas equations that we've already seen, and many of them begin with this one, equation 15. Okay, now that's not the only equation. Um, but we certainly have other equations that are associated with ideal gases. So let's start looking at ideal gases. And ultimately, we'll see that Cp minus Cv is indeed equal to the gas constant R. So perhaps I should say that what was just taken on blind faith three months ago, now we're going to be able to see where these equations come from for ideal gases. So we're now specifically talking about ideal gases. And we're going to try to utilize some of these earlier equations. First, let's just note that it's an ideal gas, right? So PV equals RT. Um, in this form of the equation, that's the specific volume. Um, and if we look at some of the various equations that we've looked at previously, you know, most notably uh, the last several equations we looked at, um, we'll notice that there are certain partial derivatives within them, like del P del TV. We're going to see del V del T P is something that we see in these various equations. Del P del V T is something that we see in these various equations. So what I would like to do is I would like to simply plug in the ideal gas equation into the equations below. And there's basically three separate derivations that will be done here. So let's see. We have del by del T of P, and of course P for an ideal gas is RT over V, holding V constant. Well, quite frankly, if we're holding V constant, then it's just going to come out of that partial derivative. And of course, R is a constant. It's the gas constant, so, so it comes out. And then we're just left with del T over del T, which is 1. So basically, this just becomes nothing more than R over V. Similarly, if we plug in the specific volume from the ideal gas equation, in other words, RT over P, holding P constant, well, we can make exactly the same statements, right? R is a constant, P is a constant, they come out, and you're just left with del T del T, which is 1. So this is simply equal to R over P. And then lastly, the del P del V term. 
So this is del, and then again, we'll replace p with rt over v. Again, holding t constant. And well, once again, the r is going to come out. Um, t is constant, right? So it comes out, so we're going to have an rt term. And then we're left with a partial of 1 over v with respect to v. And the factor holding t constant really doesn't even matter at this point. Um, well, what's the derivative of 1 over v? It's just a negative of 1 over v squared, right? So this is going to be rt over v squared with a minus sign. And then again, you have to remember that the derivative of 1 over v is the negative of 1 over v squared. But again, this is just calculus, so hopefully we remember all that. So these three equations are going to be useful. And now what we want to do is plug them into the equations that are appropriate. So if we take these and we plug into various equations of interest. So basically, we're looking at 5a, we're looking at 6a, we're looking at 8, we're looking at 11, we're looking at 15. Um, these are the equations um, where I want to do all of this. So now again, hopefully, all of you have your notes from a couple of days ago. And you know, as I'm referring to these various equations, you'll be able to see them in your notes. Um, some of these equations I'll just write out, but, but not everything. Um, let, let's just do some of these. Why don't we start with 5a? And if you recall, 5a is an equation for this internal energy, specific internal energy. And this was Cv dt, then plus t, and then del p del tv minus p dp. Okay. So what do we do when we plug the appropriate term into this? Well, it's the p over rt term. I'm sorry, the del p del tv term. And that is this one. And that's just r over v. And then minus p dp. Well. It's still an ideal gas, right? PV still equals RT. So RT over V still equals P. So P minus PDP, well, obviously, P minus P is just 0. And therefore, the specific internal energy equals CVDT. Does that look familiar to you? Yeah, it better look familiar to you. <laughs> I mean, this is the equation that we use to calculate the internal energy change whenever we had an ideal gas with constant specific heats. And of course, it also applies to solids and liquids, um, where the specific heat at constant volume equals specific heat at constant pressure, which equals what we call the heat capacity, right? So now granted, I'm really just dealing with ideal gases here, but this is an equation that we've utilized. Theoretically, we can go back to our equations for solids and liquids and using similar relationships. Keep in mind 5a, 6a, all the previous equations, they're general equations, right? They're not specifically for an ideal gas. They're for any equation. Uh, I'm sorry, they're for any substance. So um, we can certainly take these and apply them to solids and liquids, and you'll end up with the same equation. What about 6a? What do we get from that? Well, 6a and 5a were similar. Um, 6a deals with enthalpy, so this is Cp dt plus and then v minus t and del v del t p dp. Okay, so this is the equation called 6a. And again, we're going to do much the same thing. Um, del v del t p, well, that's just r over p and dp. And of course, TR over P is equal to the specific volume. It's an ideal gas. And this term goes away. And we end up simply with DH equals CPDT. So this is, again, one of the equations that, at least in your first thermal course, was just simply presented to you. And you all just had to accept it on faith. You don't need faith anymore. We've got mathematics.
Okay. Oh, that brings up a whole issue between science and spirituality, doesn't it? Uh, it's hard being an engineer sometimes, isn't it? Not just because of the math you have to do, but you know, you have a lot of friends and other people that know nothing of science and math and know a whole lot about faith, and that brings all sorts of problems into this world. Um, another thing we can't get into in a thermodynamics class, but certainly <laughs> something you can think about. All right, so what about 8 and 11? Okay. Yeah, I guess you never knew that engineering was going to be so interesting, especially when you get out there into the real world, which you're about to do. I mean, you kind of are already. Um, with equations 8 and 11, I just don't want to spend the time going through the derivation, but 8 and 11 are both in your notes from today, I believe. Um, at least I've rewritten them from today. And you can see much the same thing, um, right? 8 and 11 were our entropy equations. 8 said that ds was equal to cp dt over t minus del v del t p dp. And 11 was that the entropy change equals cv dt over t plus del p del t v dv. Um, and again, those equations both have the del V del T P or the del P del T V. So again, these are the equations that I presented at the very beginning. So you can do much the same thing. Give yourself an extra homework problem if you want. Start with the equation 8 and 11 and derive the following. So again, I'm not going to actually do this, but we can certainly find it. Um, and we get from 8 that ds is going to equal cp dt over t and then minus r dp over p. And now again, this was one of those equations for entropy change that for the most part was just presented to you in your thermal class. Well, now it can be derived. And similarly from 11, we can find that ds is going to equal cv dt over t, and then plus r dv over v. Okay, so this is another equation that's going to be useful to us. So, you know, these four equations now that I've underlined are equations that relate our specific heats to things like entropy or enthalpy or internal energy. You know, theoretically, in a laboratory somewhere, uh, we can take all sorts of data and utilizing the equations that I had presented before, you know, specifically equations 13 and 14, but we can find our numerical values for CV. And then using this last set of equations, we can use that data and ultimately we can find internal energy or enthalpy or entropy change equations. So again, this is exactly what we are looking for. And that represents most of the equations that we're going to utilize. Uh, the next thing I want to do is note that Cp minus Cv equals R. Um, in fact, I'm not even going to note it. I noted it before. But now let's go back to that equation, equation 15, and, and actually prove that. So let's look at 15. In this one, I am going to spend some time going through a derivation. So we have Cp minus Cv equals, and then there's a minus T. And in fact, this equation is still here on the board, so I'm not even going to bother to rewrite it. Uh, we have our del V del T P term, um, which as we can see over there is just equal to R over P. So this is R over P quantity squared. And then um, we have the del P del V T term. So del P del V T should be the last one down there, which it is. So that's minus R T over V squared. And now it's really just a matter of some manipulation. So we have minus t. Um, and we'll just leave the r squared over p squared. And then here we have our minus. So that cancels the other minus. So I'll just turn that into a plus. And then we have r t over v squared. Um, one more rearranging. Um, let's put all of our squared terms together. So we have a t squared, an r squared, a p 
squared and a b squared. And then we just have an r. Okay. Now, isn't this um, just rt over pv squared? And from the ideal gas equation, pv equals rt. So in other words, that's just one. In other words, Cp minus Cv equals R. Well, what do you know? Isn't that exactly what we were trying to find, right? Again, in thermo, in your earlier thermo class, you were simply told that the difference between Cp and Cv is the gas constant R. Now we realize that that's indeed true. So there's another equation that's of some use to, a, use to us. And in fact, why don't we go through an example problem and just find the value of R for water vapor at a particular temperature and pressure. And let's just go back to the type of analysis that we learned about earlier in the week, which we call the bounding analysis. Um, so anyway, are there any questions just before I go through? Okay. All right, so here's the example problem that we want to look at. Let's find R for water vapor at 100 PSIA, 700 degrees Fahrenheit using bounding analysis. So in this particular case, I'm, I'm not actually uh, going to go all the way back to this equation right here. I mean, I suppose I could just look up data somehow and find it. But I don't have that kind of data, right? I don't have CP, CV, and R data in my tables. Um, I have volume, pressure, and temperature data. So I really have to go all the way back to equation 15 um, for our bounding analysis. Um, I guess I should have erased that previously. But I am going to need it now. So perhaps it's good that it's not erased yet. All right, so from 15, which again is still over here on the board, we have Cp minus Cv equals, and we know because we're talking about an ideal gas that this equals R. However, it's equation 15 that we have to use to get our data from. So in our method of bounding analysis, we would have our minus T. And then instead of del V del T P, we're going to approximate this as simply delta V over delta T at that pressure. Okay, and this term is of course squared. So this is at the pressure given as 100 PSIA. And then we multiply by the next term. And again, we're going to approximate that partial as just delta P over delta V. And this is going to be at the temperature that's given of 700 Fahrenheit. Okay. Yeah, I just find there's a lot of glare. If you, if you guys have too much glare, let me know. I'll close the shades. Anyway, that might help. All right, so this is now the equation that we're trying to solve. Now, we know specifically that it's water vapor, so we know that we're going to have to get our data from our steam tables, uh, which is table A6. Um, and as we look at table A6, then we're going to have to go into the appropriate subtable. Um, at 100 PSI, we can go into the 100 PSI subtable, we can read down, and we'll see that there's data in 100, deg 100 degree temperature increments. So our bounding on temperature is going to be around 700 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 600 and 800 degrees Fahrenheit. That's just the bounds that are available to us in our, in our book, in our table A6. And then we're going to do something similar. Um, if we look at the temperature data um, at any particular temperature, you'll notice that the pressure subtables are in increments of 20. So it goes from 80 to 100 to 120. So the bounding on pressure is just going to be the bounds set by the different subtables. In other words, 80 PSIA and then 120 PSIA. So let's write this all down now. So Cp minus Cv, which is R, 
is equal to the negative of the temperature. So we know the temperature. That's just 700. Uh, but don't forget to add the appropriate factor on to convert this into Rankine. Uh, we definitely cannot use Fahrenheit. We, we know that. Okay. And then as far as the del delta V, delta T term, so this is going to be the specific volume at 800 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 PSIA minus the specific volume at 600 degrees Fahrenheit and 100 PSIA. And then simply divided by that temperature range, which is from 600 to 800, so just 800 minus 600. And again, this is a temperature difference. So the temperature difference in Fahrenheit is the same as Rankine. So I'll just put Rankine. All right, and then this whole thing gets squared. And then we multiply that by the delta P, delta V at the constant temperature. So the pressure difference we know is just 120 minus 80. These are both in PSIA. Um, and then divided by the change in specific volume. And this would be the specific volume in our bound, so at 120 PSIA and 700 degrees, right? This is at the constant temperature. And then minus the specific volume at 80 PSI and 700 degrees. I'm sorry, yeah, 700 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. So let's close that bracket. So really, it's now just a matter of going into our tables and finding the data. So let's just do that. So we have our first term. That's just minus 1159.67 ranking. And again, we're just pulling data out of our table. So we go into our 100 PSIA subtable. We read down to 800 Fahrenheit. And we find that this is 7. 0.4457, that's going to be cubic feet per pound mass, um, and then at 600 degrees Fahrenheit, 100 PSIA, we get 6.2167, these are both cubic feet per pound mass, and then we divide this by, well, just 200 degrees Rankine, whole thing squared, and then we have 40 PSI in the numerator, and we have to look up our specific volume. So this is 5.6829, and that's 120 PSIA, 700 Fahrenheit, and then 8.5616. And these are both, again, in cubic feet per pound. Okay. So we really just have to go through our mathematics. And we end up with 0 0.6085, at least mathematically we get that. But the units are rather odd. Um, PSIA units are still going to be there. Um, one of the cubic feet per pound mass is going to cancel, but we have the other cubic feet per pound mass and our degree R. So this is going to be in PSIA foot cubed per pound mass degree R. Now I might note that um, for some gases, actually for all the gases, I think it's table A1, um, it gives you these units, although I wouldn't consider these the standard units. Uh, BTUs per pound are the standard units, well, per pound per degree R, but PSA foot cubed is often used because in many problems we have pressure data and the PSA units will cancel. Uh, nonetheless, what I would do here, just to convert it, is just to divide by the conversion factor. So this is the number of PSA foot cubed per BTU. So that's 5.40395. So this is in the inside back cover of your textbook. And this gives me 0.1126 BTUs per pound mass. Okay. So this would be the gas constant. Now, I always would like to compare this to what's in the book. So if we look at table A1E for water, the gas constant listed is 0 0.1102 BTUs per pound mass. Okay. So we're certainly off by a little bit, but we're not off by that much. I mean, quite frankly, the error here is only, what, 24 parts out of 1,000? So uh, 
the error is, is what, 2.5%, 2%, something like that? So it's a very small error. And probably the largest reason for the error is because we're using such a large bound, right? I mean, we've got a, a bound of you know, 20 degrees on each side of our pressure and a full 100 degrees on each side of the temperature. Uh, we certainly wouldn't be using those bounds if this were a real research lab and we were taking real data, right? Our real data would be very, very tight bound on pressures, maybe a half a pound and maybe just a degree on temperatures. So all our data is going to be a lot closer to the actual point and therefore the error is going to be diminished. Um, but nonetheless, I would say that this checks out just fine. Is it perfect? No, but at least it illustrates the usefulness of these equations. Okay, so let me move on. And there's a couple of other terms that are also important. Um, you know, these are covered in the textbook. In fact, all of this is obviously covered in the textbook. These other terms, though, um, I don't know, a lot of people don't really think of them much as far as thermodynamic properties, although they indeed are. Um, but nonetheless, we have two new properties, so let's just continue. Okay. So the first one is what we call the volume expansivity. Okay. And it's simply given the Greek letter beta. And in words, this is defined as the rate change in volume um, with respect to temperature at constant pressure. But it's per unit volume. So how would we express that? Well, the rate change in volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure is just del V, del T P, and this is a capital letter V. And this is per unit volume, so therefore we have to divide by volume. Okay. And now what is customary is to just divide by mass, both in the numerator and the denominator. The volume terms become specific volume terms. So we just have 1 over specific volume, and then times del V del T P. Okay. So this is our volume expansivity beta. And then there's one other term. Um, the other one is called isothermal compressibility. And isothermal compressibility is just given the Greek letter alpha. And in words, this is the rate change in volume um, but this time it's going to be with respect uh, not to temperature but to pressure, so with respect to pressure um, at constant volume. I can't read my notes again. Um, no, I'm sorry, I said this wrong. So this is with respect to pressure at constant temperature. Okay, so that one's the change in volume with respect to temperature at constant pressure. This one's the change in volume with respect to pressure at constant temperature, but also per unit volume. Okay, so. Alpha then is defined. Um, now, we would note that there's going to be the partial of V with respect to P holding T constant, right? That's the rate change in volume with respect to pressure at constant temperature. And again, this is per unit volume. Okay. And in fact, by definition, whoops, these are total volumes. Um, and then I would just note that it's customary to put a negative sign on this because it turns out that dVdt at constant pressure is typically going to be a negative value, so you take the negative of that just to get a magnitude. 
So by definition, we're going to include the minus sign on here. And then again, we'll divide by mass in numerator and denominator. So we get minus 1 over the specific volume, and then del V del T. Uh-oh. Pressure, temperature. OK, now I know why you're trying to get my attention. I've misplaced these terms. So with respect to pressure, holding temperature constant. So this is the pressure, holding temperature constant. All right, thank you. So these are also important. Now, we've never even heard of these. We don't have any idea why they're important or why they're not important. Um, what I like to think of these as being important for is when you're trying to design some sort of a system and you're undergoing a process whereby during that process the density might change. Okay? Um, density meaning the inverse of the specific volume. Okay? So if you have some process that's taking place um, and your fluid is undergoing a density change, then that means as that fluid moves through that process, you're going to have to consider that density change when you design your pipe diameters or your casing diameters, say for heat exchangers or turbines or pumps or something like that, right? If the fluid's density is changing, you need to take that into consideration in the mechanical design process. So that's where I feel that these are important. It gives you a feel for whether the process you're analyzing is going to result in a big change in density so that you can consider that in your design. Now, the next thing that I want to do is show these two equations relative to equation 15 again. So back to 15. In fact, again, I'll just leave it here. So back to equation 15, and it's still here. Um, and what you might note is that some of these terms, like here's a del V del PT term, here's the inverse of a del V del PT term, there's a del V del TP term, that's right here. So we should be able to manipulate this equation and get it in terms of just alphas and betas. So that's what we're going to do next. All right, so again, from equation 15, Cp minus Cv equals, and then we have minus T. Um, now, our first term, our del V del Tp term, um, well, you can see that's actually just going to be beta times the specific volume. So I didn't number these particular equations, but you can see, of course, beta times specific volume is del V del Tp. And that del V del Tp is now squared. So this is just beta times specific volume squared. Okay. And then the next term is the del P del V T term. And the del P del V T term, well, if we just move this to the left-hand side, then that's going to be del V del Pt. And then the alpha is going to come over to the right-hand side. And it's going to be in the denominator. So this is just minus 1 over alpha times specific volume. And now you can see that, um, well, at least one of the specific volume terms is going to go away. And we would end up with this, minus t, and then beta squared, v squared, over minus alpha v. The minuses cancel each other out. Uh, one of the specific volumes cancels. And we just end up with. Um, specific volume times temperature times beta squared over alpha. And this is Cp minus Cv. So again, another equation that we will find useful to us. Okay. Again, if we have data from our lab for alpha and beta, um, you know, we should be able to find this difference between Cp and Cv for, you know, any of a number of substances. Is there a question? Was there a negative on the 1 over L2? Yes. They both had negatives, and they canceled. The minus within equation 15, and then the minus on the alpha Is there v term. Is there a on the, on the top right? Or no? Yeah, I don't think so. 
Oh, I see. You mean did I forget to write down the minus sign? Yes, absolutely I did. Um, alpha, and there's a minus one over V. So thank you. Yeah, this should have a minus sign attached to it. And then that minus sign cancels. So thank you. All right, so how about one more example problem? And that should be it. So once again, I'm going to have a problem involving water vapor. So let's find alpha and beta and Cp minus Cv um, for steam at 400 PSIA, 600 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Um, and again, I should say using mounting analysis. All right. So it's pretty straightforward. Our equations for alpha and beta are pretty straightforward. We'll just start with alpha. And again, because these equations are already in the board, I don't think I'll rewrite them. We're going to do our usual approximation. So alpha is just going to be um, minus 1 over the specific volume. And then instead of del V del T, I'm sorry, del V del PT, um, we'll just write this as delta V over delta P at the given temperature. Okay. So this bounding analysis is really pretty straightforward. So it's just minus 1 over V. And then here, um, well, the pressure given is 400 PSIA. We know we're talking about steam. We go into our steam tables. We find that the subtables on pressure actually go in 50 pound increments at this point. So 350 is the lower pressure, 450 is the higher pressure. So we need to take the specific volume at 450 PSIA and at the given temperature of 600 Fahrenheit then minus the specific volume at 350 PSIA and 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And the delta P then, well, it's just 450 minus 350 PSIA. Okay. Um, so we just look up the numbers. So the specific volume is going to be looked up at the given pressure and temperature. So this is Perhaps I should have put 400 PSIA and 600 degrees F over here. Um, but nonetheless, the specific volume at this point is 1.4765 cubic feet per pound. And then as far as the specific volume at 450 and 600, so this is 1.3001. And then at 350 PSIA 600, this is 1.7030 all cubic feet per pound mass, and then divided by 100 PSIA. And in this particular case, the units for specific volume are going to cancel directly, and we're going to end up with just the units of 1 over PSIA. So alpha equals 0 0.002729 per PSIA. Okay. In other words, this is going to be how the volume changes with respect to pressure per unit volume. Right. Right. So let's do essentially the same thing in order to find beta. Um, now again, beta is still written over here. So we have 1 over the specific volume. And we're going to approximate beta as delta V over delta T holding P constant. So again, using our bounding analysis, um, this specific volume is going to be at the given 400 PSIA, 600 Fahrenheit. Um, the change in specific volume, well, really, it's very much like we just looked at. Um, this is going to be specific volume. Um, but this time, 
it's going to be as the temperature changes. So this is going to be the specific volume at 650 degrees Fahrenheit and at the constant pressure of 400 PSIA. And then minus the specific volume at 550 degrees Fahrenheit at 400 PSIA. And then simply divided by the temperature change, which is 650 minus 550. And again, the temperature change is in Fahrenheit, but it's the same as ranking. So I'll just show per R. And again, now it's just a matter of plugging in the appropriate numbers. So the specific volume we already found, that's 1.4765 cubic feet per pound. And then we just look up the specific volume in our steam tables. So it's 1.5650, and then minus 1.3840. And again, these are both in cubic feet per pound. And then divided by 100 ranking. So again, it's just a matter of going through the math now. And we end up with 0 0.001226 per degree, per degree R. Now, having this information, you know, based on our bounding analysis, um, it wouldn't be bad for us to go into property tables and just kind of look and verify that these numbers are consistent with the tabulated data. But, but we can't do that in our class, right? We don't have any tabulated data for either the isothermal compressibility or the volume expansivity, so we really don't have any choice but to just leave it at this point. Um, but let's finish the problem. The, the last part of the problem asks you to find Cp minus Cv. And now we have an equation that was presented over there. That's just Vt b squared over alpha. I'm sorry, beta squared over alpha. So here we know all of our data. We, we know that the specific volume is still 1.4765 cubic feet per pound mass. Uh, the temperature has been given to us. So that's our 1159. 0.67 degrees right keen. Um, no, no, 1059, right? 600 plus 459.67. So this is 1059.67 ranking. Um, and then the beta we have, so 0.001226 per degree right keen. And that's squared. And then divided by alpha. And alpha was 0 0.002729 per PSIA. Now, clearly, these units are a little bit odd. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to use some sort of conversions. But, but it's not a difficult conversion. It's just one we have to deal with. So again, go to the inside back cover of your textbook. Um, use the same conversion factor that was used in the previous problem, um, 5.40395. And that's just the conversion from PSIA foot cubed into BTUs. So we go through the math. All our units end up working out. We get 0.1595 BTUs per pound mass per degree R. So that's the end of the problem. But it's not really the end of the problem. We have to think about our results here. Uh, please note that in this particular problem, I was careful not to say find R. I asked you to find the difference between Cp and Cv. And you look at this number, and we're still talking about water, well, water vapor. Why didn't we get a number that's closer to what we found in the previous example problem? I mean, we found that Cp minus Cv was R, and it was like 0.112. In the book, it's 0.110. So why are we so far off? I mean, we're, we're off by like almost 50%. Did we do a, or did we make an error? Is, is there an issue with the methodology? No. It's just not an ideal gas under these conditions. Um, keep in mind that for a gas to be considered an ideal gas, the pressure has to be at least two orders of magnitude less than the critical point pressure. And the temperature has to be at least twice the critical point temperature. I mean, only then, and, and these are rules that are presented on, bleh, what, like page 140, 139, something like that of your textbook that should have been covered in your first thermal class. Um, but if you just do those tests, we find that this is indeed 
well outside the range that we would consider to be an ideal gas. So yeah, R does equal Cp minus Cv if we happen to have an ideal gas, but that doesn't mean that all gases are ideal gases. So um, clearly at this point, steam is not an ideal gas, at least not at this particular pressure and temperature. I mean, if it was an ideal gas, then I'd have ended up with a value that's closer to 0.11. Um, so no, there's no math errors here, at least that I'm aware of. It's possible that I made a math error and I'm not aware of it, but I don't think so. So again, another example with some description at the end. Please keep in mind that if one were to do this kind of work in a lab, all your data has to be extremely accurate. The calculations have to be done with, with extreme precision. Um, you know, we're not able to do this in any kind of research labs we have here at Cal Poly, because frankly, we just don't have research labs here at Cal Poly. Not that that isn't going to change over the next decade, but for now, anyway, um, eh, you know, go to Caltech or one of the UCs or a private school if you're interested in working on this kind of applied thermodynamics. Anyway, any questions? All right, so that's all we have for today. Um, this ends our discussion of thermodynamic property relations, and next week we start dealing with the complicated stuff, which is mixtures. Um, we've never dealt with mixtures of pure substances. Now, finally, we're going to deal with mixtures of gases, uh, ideal gases, so it'll be a little bit simplified, but still, mixtures is not the same as pure substances. That'll be starting next week. Um, okay, so see you all. Have a good weekend, everybody. And I will see you Monday. Uh, please don't forget to pick up your homework again.